Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, if you would join me in reading of God's Word. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a short while. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of being in fellowship here today with people that are like-minded. Thank you that we have your word to guide us through life. Thank you that we are not blinded to the future, that we know what's going to happen because you have told us in your prophetic word. Thank you for that. Help us to be prepared for the changes coming and help us to realize that one day our king is coming to reign as king of kings and lord of lords on this earth, that Satan will be bound during that millennial reign and that you will have your way as leader of this world. And we are so thankful for that, Lord. We look forward to that. We say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. We need you desperately. Thank you again for this time together. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, things that you want us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Satan has changed. As you know, the theme of Revelation is Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming in judgment. And Jesus is coming to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, where have we been? Well, we've just been through an agonizing chapter 6 through 19 of the tribulation period and how awful that was. And just to remind you of how awful it was, I'm going to repeat to you the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 21 to 22, when Jesus told us how bad it was, for then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be, such as not been seen, nor ever shall be. And then he goes on to say, unless those days were shortened, no flesh, no humanity, nobody would survive, would be saved. But for the elect's sake, and I think the elect in that context is the nation of Israel because the whole tribulation period is directed to the nation of Israel. For the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Now, we don't want to gloss over those words. I don't plan on being here for any of the tribulation. I'm really hoping that the pre-trib view is right. I'm counting on that, okay? But we don't want to just, just gloss through this. Remember, all the judgments that have come, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments, are the wrath of God being poured out on this earth. Now, I want you to think about something. Why are the judgments, why are the judgments going to be stopped? Why do they come to an end? Well, it's for the elect's sake, for the nation of Israel. Remember, the tribulation period is the 70th week of Daniel. We've been through this so many times, you probably have this memorized, but Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Why is he saying that? Because they're coming out of Babylonian captivity. The angel Gabriel tells Daniel that this is the amount of time that is allotted to you. 70 week years, 490 years are allotted for your people. Now, they would have, we would have gone into the kingdom had they received the Messiah. Fortunately for us, they didn't because the Gentiles are grafted in. God knew what they were going to do. He is sovereign. He's in charge of all things. But we know that at the 483-year point, Messiah was cut off, but not for himself. It wasn't for his sins. He died for the sins of the world. And we have another overhead here, and there's actually two of them that are quite similar. This is a 69 years from the decree to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in the times of Nehemiah until Messiah Nagid would come. There would be 483 years, six, or 69 weeks. Messiah is cut off, killed, and there's a pause for the Jewish people. Pause for the Jewish people. Now, the next slide. This pause is called the church age, this 2,000-year period of time. At the end of the church age, a covenant will be made with Israel, with the Antichrist in Israel, and we will go in. That's the starting point of the seven-year tribulation. The whole tribulation period is designed for the Jewish people to come to know their Messiah. And it will take all the way to the very end for that to accomplish, be accomplished. We've been through this many times. We know that in our last te teaching that the Antichrist and the false pop prophet were captured alive and thrown into the lake of fire. That is their eternal abode. 
we also learn that the earth dwellers, they will be killed. Those are the ones that follow Antichrist. They will be killed by the sword, by the word of God that comes out of the mouth of Jesus. And they go to a place called torment. That was their holding tank. And if you remember, there was paradise. There was torment. We had the picture of that. And hopefully you remember what that is. Paradise is emptied. Today when you die as a believer, absent from the body, present with the Lord. But if you die as a non-believer, you're in a holding area called torment, awaiting the great white throne judgment. So Jesus is going to return. He's going to return with vengeance. And he's going to take over permanent rulership of earth. There will be no more kingdoms arising. No more human kingdoms arising. He's taking back ownership. And remember, when he does, it will be bloody and it will be final. Bloody and final. And the birds of prey are called to clean up the mess. And remember those beautiful birds that we had, those canaries that were coming? Yeah, yeah. These vultures are going to come. These carnivorous birds are called from all over the world to clean up the mess. And what I wanted to get across to you is that sin brings death. Sin, sin brings a mess. And these birds, whenever you see a turkey vulture garbling up something on the side of the road, think that is the result of sin. Because sin brought death into God's creation. Now, this week, we're going to talk about Satan is chained, and he's chained with a mega chain. But before we get into the verses, there's a few things that I need to describe to you uh, about the millennium, the millennium. Now, this information is taken from Mark Hitchcock's book, 101 Answers, or Qu Answer to Questions about the Book of Revelation. And he says in his book the following, the millennium is made up of two Latin words, milli, a thousand, and annum, Years, a thousand years. Now, six times this word, thousand years, this millennial uh, reference, is used in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. Now, if God repeats something, if he says something once, okay, you better listen. If he says it twice, oh, that's really important. But six times, we need to know that he's serious about the millennial reign of Christ. Now, the reason I'm saying that, all people don't agree with the millennium. All people don't agree with the thousand-year millennial reign. Now, there are three main views of the millennium. We would be pre-millennialist. Pre-millennialist, okay? Pre-millennialism. Pre means before. Christ will return before the millennial reign of Christ, a thousand years. It's the literal interpretation of the Scripture view. We view this literally. The church has embraced the pre-millennialism for the first 300 years of the church. That's an important thing to remember. Premillennialism. We, we believe that Jesus comes back before the millennial reign of Christ. Amillennialism. Ah, ah means absent. No millennium. That was the dominant view from the 4th and 5th century on. Augustine was the one that promoted that view. It was popularized by Augustine. And it's dominated to today. Amillennialism, ah you must know, is the majority view of the church today. Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, many Reformed churches, many Bible churches, that sort of thing, they view it as amillennialism. Now, let me just tell you a few things about amillennialism. The number 1,000 is symbolic, although it says it's specifically, literally in the text. They contend that the kingdom is present now. Now, if you are in the millennial kingdom now, are you enjoying this ride? Isn't this just wonderful? Is your climate perfect? Think about winter. Think about the slush and the slop. No. This, the kingdom commenced at the first coming of Christ and it culminates in a second coming and they believe that Satan is bound now. Now, excuse me, if he's bound now, who lets him out? Who keeps letting that dude out? Because that is an amazing thing. He's bound? That's, that's, it's ludicrous, really. It's silly. The kingdom is spiritual in nature and it rules in the hearts of people. Now, post-millennialism, I want to spend the most time on. And of course, that means after. Post is after. After Jesus returns, Christ returns after the millennium. Post-millennialism was developed in the 16th century by a Unitarian minister named Daniel Withby. And it's similar to amillennialist in that they believe the kingdom is present now during the present age. They believe it's a long period of time rather than a thousand years. And they too believe we're in the millennium now. Now, the difference between post-millennialists is this. They believe that the church age or this era 
will crescendo into a golden age. Isn't it? Now, the, it, it? Of the church. Christ will come back to a prepared world, a prepared earth, post-millennialism. Now, this was popular at the time in the 16th century. People always want the power, the power to do something, and we're going to just going to get kick Satan, kick Satan out. We're going to rule and we're going to reign. Every, that's what humans want. But this view fell out of favor with the Civil War. We're not crescendoing into power. Then it fell out of view in the First World War, Second World War, but it's gained popularity today. And this view asserts this, that the church becomes more and more influential in the culture and makes the world suitable for Jesus' return. This is termed kingdom now theology or dominion theology, where the church is going to take over mountains. And there's a seven mountain mandate in, in post-millennialism. That the church, and this, is, this would be great if the church did this, okay? It took over these things. This would be a very good thing. But I don't think this is going to happen. It's taking over education. Now, how are we doing with taking over education? Religion, family, business, government, arts, entertainment. How, are, how, how is the church making inroads in entertainment today? It's as filthy and nasty and rotten as it has ever been in the history of the world. And then the media. I mean, do we get any truth in the media today? No, we, it doesn't seem to me like we're taking over these places, but that's what they believe. So this view has been embraced by many charismatics and many Pentecostals. The new apostolic reformation, which I will call the NAR in the future, teaches that the church of the 21st century will be ruled by apostles and prophets. Just like in the old. But remember, the church was built on the apostles and the prophets, Ephesians 2.20. Jesus being the chief cornerstone. Let me ask you, how many times is the foundation of a building laid? One time. One time. So they're very big into a new revelation. A new word from God. A new word from God. Thus saith the Lord. And they actually have prophet schools and healing schools. Now hear this, these places that have healing schools, do you know what happened during COVID? They were closed down. <laughs> I mean, excuse me, there's something wrong here. They're prophet schools. Out of their prophet schools came innumerable people that were prophesying, Donald Trump's going to be the president. Donald Trump's going to be the president. And they ranted and ranted and ranted, and that didn't come about. And now they, with their tail between their legs, are th saying, oh, we missed that one. Oh, no, you're a false prophet. Get the rocks and get ready. If you want to take on the mantle of that title, get ready to be stoned. The NAR view promotes man as saving the earth, preparing this world system for Jesus' return, that things will get better and be better. But hear this, the Bible, in contrast, states the world be, will be a giant mess in rebellion against Christ before he returns. How do I know this to be true? Because I've read the Bible, okay? <laughs> Hear the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, 37. This is how it's going to be. For as it was in the days of Noah, we're also, so also it will be with the coming of the Son of Man. Now, what was the days of Noah like? Now, they talk about giving in marriage and going about their life, but the, they're choosing the days of Noah specifically because it was raunch. It was bad. It was as bad as anything could ever be. It was one big mess. That's what Jesus is coming back to. He's the one that corrects this thing, not the church. Luke 18, 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he finally find faith on the earth? Now, Jesus said when he comes back, persecution, apostasy, and unbelief will reign on the earth. So it'll be one big mess. Matthew 24, 9. This is what's going to happen to those people that are on the earth. And then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. That's one big mess, isn't it? And finally, Matthew 24, 22, Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved alive. Now, that is pretty clear. It's going to be very, very, very bad. Jesus said there's no time worse than this in the history of the world. But yet people embrace this. They love this. They love the apostle and prophet and we're in control thing. To me, that is wrong. Kingdom now theology is not biblical. 
The church is not getting better and better. Guess what? The church is sick. The church has the flu. I don't want to say COVID. It's got the flu. <laughs> it's sick. The end time church is filled with apostasy. It's Laodicean, folks. It's lukewarm. And what did Jesus say? I will spew you. I will vomit you out of my mouth. How did the Laodicean church look to themselves? Remember how they viewed themselves? Listen, to, in Revelation 3.17, because you say, Jesus saying, you say, you church say, you have been wealthy and have need of nothing. They thought their wealth was a sign of blessing. They thought their big was a sign of blessing. Could be, could not be. It's not an indication. It's not an indication. Jesus says, this is how you are. You are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. The end time church, the lukewarm church is sickening, sickening to Jesus. Now I have another chart here just to give you a little brief review of the millenniums. Again, we are pre-millennial. We believe that Jesus comes back before the millennial reign of Christ. Post-millennial, he comes back after the reign of Christ. Ah, millennialism, it's symbolic, and there's no real millennium. And by the way, this is what most of the church believes today. Now, if you believe in one, two, or three, or don't believe in one, two, or three, you have to believe that Jesus is coming back. Okay, let's just put it that way. You do have to believe that to be orthodox. But you can fit into one of these three categories and still be Christian. Okay, I want to make sure that you understand that. There are a lot of very solid Christians in each one of these groups, just that I think that these are so not, you can't, can't, you can't prove it by God's word. So, with that introduction on the millennium, verse 1 and 2, Satan is chained. Satan is changed. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. You know what that great is in Greek? Mega. Have you ever heard that word before? Mega. Mega, mega chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, and it's going to tell us who it is, who was the devil and Satan. Just take a pause right here and hear what I'm going to say. The devil, the word means is diabolos, and it's accuser, slanderer, but it also is this. It is one that cast himself between two people or two entities. He cast himself between humans and God. He cast himself between people here today so that we are in conflict with one another. He is a master at this. He is a master. And then Satan is the adversary, the opposer of anything that God supports. So please hear that. And guess what's going to happen? He will be bound for a thousand years. You talk about binding Satan, which I'm going to talk about more in just a second. He is going to be bound, binded up, if there's such a word, for a thousand years. So, after all the immense pain through the histories and epochs of time that Satan has perpetrated in this world, finally, he's going to be out of action for a thousand years. This angel has a key, he has a chain, and it's the key to the bottomless pit. And the bottomless pit is a place exclusively for fallen angels. Humans aren't there. This is their confinement. Tartarus is their permanent confinement. There's some people, there's some conjecture that the abuso or the bottomless pit may be time of temporary confinement, and we see that Satan will be released, so I guess you can look at it as temporary. But it's the abuso, the abyss, a depthless, deep pit, endless, endless. Now, the result of Satan being confined in the pit is that sin and death in the kingdom, in the millennial kingdom, will be greatly reduced. Now, the chain. Now, I don't know what kind of chain you use to chain up a spirit being. So it's not what we picture or visualize as a chain. But it's something that's going to render him inactive. Out of action, useless. He'll be inactive in the affairs of humanity. Now, that's also good news because he's a stirrer. He likes to stir it up. Stir it up. Now, I want you to notice who does the chaining. It's one angel. One. Now, he has the authority of God. One angel, one powerful angel. It's not an archangel. 
It's not another cherubim or seraphim. It is one angel. It's not a regiment of angels. It's one angel equipped with the authority of God. And that word authority in, this, in that context would be exousia. E-X-O-U-S-I-A of God. And he binds Satan because he has the authority of God. He could be the biggest weak link in heaven. But he's got the authority of God and he's powerful. More powerful than the most powerful of all created things. Satan. Lucifer. This tells us something. Exousia is significant. God's delegated authoritative power is significant. The Holy Spirit dwelling in you as a believer gives you power, dunamis power, and the authority to do what God has told you to do, the exousia. Now, I want to take a little study on this word exousia. So bear with me. Again, it means authority is exousia. It's a Greek word most often translated authority or power. And it's especially used when in relationship to moral influence. Exousia can be thought of in the terms of jurisdiction or dominion or rights or privilege or ability. So with that thought in mind, everybody there with what exousia is, it's a fancy word, means delegated authority. I want to suggest to you, I believe that you have God's exousia, his delegated authority. You have the Holy Spirit within you with the dunamis power to carry out the authority that he's given you. To not fall for Satan's schemes. Okay? Or your flesh tugs or your flesh pull. That's the power to navigate through the turbulent waters of this life. Now, I think that everyone here must realize that life is turbulent. It is not Lake Michigan on some of those days when it is so calm, it's almost like a mud puddle. You throw a little rock out into it, you see the ripples forever. That is not life. That is how we want our lives to be. But oftentimes it's like Lake Michigan, and I wish I would have put a picture of the, of the, of the, of the wave just splashing over the, 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 on the piers at, at, at Grand Haven and just smothering the lighthouse there, just, just how violent it can be. That's how our lives can be from time to time. Placid or violent. And it can all change in a click. In a click. Boom. Click. So navigate through turbulent waters of life. It's the authority to resist the devil. And remember, he will flee from you in James 4, 7. The authority to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ in 2 Corinthians 10, 5. It's the authority, and actually it's a command actually that we have, is to put on the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6, 11. And what are we to do? Take your stand. You be steadfast in the faith. Take your stand against the schemes of the devil. Now Strong's 1849, which is not in your notes, so just listen to me, simply says, exousia is authoritative power. And Jesus said something regarding this in Matthew 28, 18, the Great Commission. He said, all power, all exousia, all the authority of the Father, the triune Godhead, is given to me in heaven and earth. And he says, therefore, to his disciples, go and make disciples. You have Jesus' authority to go and make disciples. That was to the disciples then. That is for the disciples today. That is a command for all of us to go into the world. It's this authoritative power that Jesus gave his disciples, the power and authority to make disciples. So Jesus gives us authority now over all the works of the enemy. That's an important thing to remember. This authority will follow us into the millennial reign of Christ. Now, this is very important because you're going into a millennium where your job description is going to change. Okay? Your job description is going to change. You will have kingdom ruling authority. And I think this very seriously, that you are being trained right now for the kingdom of heaven to reign and to rule with Christ with his delegated exousia. His authority. Now, how are we, be, how are we to, to reign? We're being trained now. How, how are we being trained for this? We're becoming more and more like Christ while we're here. We're actively engaged in the sanctification process. Remember, that's set apart unto God. 
becoming more like Jesus, being conformed to the likeness of Christ. That's Romans 8, 29. That is what we are to do. That's our whole journey after we're saved, is to become more like Jesus and less like us. And that is why I don't take the pointer and, and stick you in the eye with the pointer because I'm trying to become more like Jesus and less like me. I'm just letting you in on some of my perverted thoughts, okay? I'm just being honest. When we use his delegated authority, we are preparing for our leadership roles for eternity. Eternity. Jesus will rule and reign. All enemies will be under his feet. We do know that. And guess what? We will rule and reign under him with his delegated authority. That's an important thing to remember. We will have his exousia authority to reign with him. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 through 19 is very revealing. So you Bible students, turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. And I will give you just a second to do this because I think this is an important verse. It starts out with this, that you may know. Now, God's not trying to hide stuff from us. That you may know, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And watch this, number three. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power, dunamis power, towards us. His dunamis power is towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, his ichthus, his strength. What is Jesus, what is, what is Paul saying here? God's power, his dunamis power is directed towards the believer, which is far greater than Satan's power. You must know who you are in Christ. That's going to be a little bit later. Okay. Believers have the exceeding greatness of his power. We have the power to reign in the flesh life. We do not have to be led around by our nose by every fleshly desire or every pull of the world or every carrot that Satan drops before us. We have the power to say no. That's called karatos power, and I didn't put it in your notes, but that is the power to say no. Believers have the exceeding greatness of his power, dunamis power. And anytime you see dunamis, the prefix duna is the ability to do. God gives you the ability to do what he's called you to do. He's given you the power to, to be great. And that word greatness is huperbelo, unimaginably great power, unimaginably great power towards us who believe. Now, how often do you feel like you're walking in unimaginably great power? Now, we feel like, you know, get your shoulders back, great power, but how do we look most of the time? You know, our lips on the ground, just kind of dragging along. Hey, we have God, the Holy Spirit in us, unimaginably great power is that our, we have access to. Pick up your chin, walk around, not cocky or arrogant, but just, just in, in the confidence of your God. So know this. Know this. This is important. Know you, who you are in Christ and tap into his power, which is available to every single believer. The power to make faith choices instead of flesh choices. Now that's a victor. You start making some overcomer, conquering, victorious faith choices instead of flesh choices, you know you're on your journey to growth. The power to overcome, to be victors, to be conquerors, not victims. The power, listen to this one, to not fall for the same trap of the devil over and over and over and over, which we have a tendency to do because he knows our weak spots. The power to not relinquish ground to him. The power to win the mind war. Remember this. And you know what I'm going to say. He who controls the mind controls the person. Okay? The power to win that war. Hear this loud and clear. In this way, Satan is bound, chained in my life. 
He has no power, no control. He is chained up and powerless. That's how you bind Satan. Okay? Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about binding the way that it's used today in much of the church. Much of the church. There's a lot of talk about binding Satan. When you go to Caesarea Philippi, and, and your trip to Israel, and you get to see all those demonic gods on the hillside, and busload after busload after busload are binding Satan, inhibiting his power, and they think they're doing something in the spirit realm. Well, let me assure you, I don't believe that to be so. People use words like, I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. It's commonly used today. Hear this. Nowhere in Scripture are believers told to bind Satan in another person's life. You don't see that. Jesus always does the binding, the inhibiting of Satan as, this is a, this, this is a, this is a pre prerequisite, as we yield to his rule and we obey him. When we do that, Satan is bound in our lives. We can bind Satan in our lives by tapping into God's power and saying no to his schemes, using the tools that he has given us and when we do, he is chained up. We have bound him. He is, we can bind him in our own lives. He is rendered powerless. Now, in our world today, it is clear that Satan is not presently bound. How do I know that? Because in 1 Peter 5, 8, what does he do? He goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, it doesn't sound like he's penned up to me. It doesn't seem like he's out of action to me. And what does he go on to say in verse 9, Peter? He says, how do we resist him? Steadfast in the faith. We don't make slanderous accusations against him. We don't say, I'm binding you. No, you, you, your power comes from being obeying God, having, submitting to God's rule over you. That is how Satan is bound in your life. Satan will be changed, and you, believer, have the authority and power to bind him in your life as you obey and yield. I can't say that enough. Now, Satan, in verse 3, is going to be cast, shut up, sealed in the bottomless pit. Now, now, when he says shut up, that means he's going to be confined, doesn't it? But in my mind, it is good to not hear that voice coming to me anymore. He will be shut up because he keeps chirping in our ears. Chirping in our ears. Verse 3. And he cast him into the bottomless pit. Doesn't sound pleasant, does it? And shut him up, set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. And then we have this sentence. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And everybody that gets to that verse goes, why? Why in the world are you going to let that dude out again? Well, we'll cover that in just a second. So this is definitive of God. This is, this is a, at least a thousand year definitive of God dealing, dealing with Satan. He's cast. And that word is balo, and it means to throw, to thrust, and it implies force. I like to just see him as just like a, like a torpedo, just taking a boom, right down boom, into the pit. With force. And guess what? He's sealed. He's shut up. He's securely in prison. And there will be no appeal. There will be no rescue on the way. There will be no escape. For a thousand years, Satan will be confined with the other fallen angels. Now, let me ask you a question. If you were another fallen angel, and you're in that pit for a thousand years, and Satan's right there, might you ask him a few questions? Like, what went wrong here, buddy? I mean, we were supposed to be victorious. Can you imagine that may, it may cause a little consternation in the prison cells there? Yeah, could. Good, his thought. Think about this. Fallen angels are separated from God for a reason. They failed their time of testing. And I want to take a little journey here about God giving us choice. God gives all of his higher creation the ability to choose contrary to him. Most of you are familiar with this teaching, but I think it's a good place 
to reintroduce it today. Angels and human, they have contrary choice. All of God's higher creation, the angelic realm and the human realm are tested. And guess what? Your life is one big giant test. How many are you going to pass and how many are going to fail? Are you going to graduate with the D minus like I did? Or are you going to be summa cum laude? Now, if you're in Christ, you're going to, everybody's going to be summa cum laude, but it'll be different levels, I, I guess, of that. So the angels had their time of testing. They were created perfect. God does everything perfect. The angels were created perfect. Angels who sided with Satan failed their time of testing. Their consequence is that they are lost and separated from God forever, and they are now called unholy, evil, fallen angels. That's how they're termed. The angels who did, not, who did pass the test, who passed their test, are called elect angels. How do I know that? Because there's a verse in the Bible that tells us this. 1 Timothy 5.21, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect or chosen angels. These angels are called elect and chosen, the holy angels, when they pass their time of testing. They are confirmed in their holiness and are no longer temptable. That's an important concept because people often ask, will the angels rebel in heaven again? And I say, no. No, they are confirmed in their holiness. Now, what about humans? They also were created perfect. Adam and Eve were created perfect. Adam did not have one thought about taking a thing and putting it in somebody's eye. He did not have one thought about that, did not enter his mind, because he was perfect, okay? He was perfect. So Adam and Eve were presented with the test with evil, the temptation of Satan, and you know the story. They chose contrary to God. Don't eat of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Don't eat it. And the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Die. You would think that would be a little stunning to them, okay? The choice was simple. Obey God or obey themselves. They failed their time of testing. They were, fa they are, they, they were called fallen, condemned. The decision was fatal. And death came into the humanic, into the humanic realm. Hu humanic. Human, human realm. There we go. Physical and spiritual. Physical and spiritual death. So God had to come to the rescue, didn't he? For humanity. And God's rescue, as you know, all of your, most of your Christians, God sent his only begotten son to redeem the earth. Jesus died in our place so that we could live with him forever. The message is very simple, but very profound. Those who believe and receive the gift of salvation are saved from the wrath of God. That's very important. Because if you reject God's salvation, you will be under the wrath of God. Romans 5.10 Those who believe and receive the gift are saved from the wrath of God. Those who believe are called the elect or the chosen of God. They are confirmed in their belief. Now, we have three things that I'm going to mention to you that I've mentioned so many times that I didn't put these in the notes. Well, actually, I didn't put them in the notes. I have to confess because it was getting really long. And sometimes I can be irritating if I get too long when Chris is typing out my notes. <laughs> so justified. The minute, the second you believed in Jesus Christ, you were justified, declared righteous, the imputed righteousness of Christ, it was, your righteousness of Christ is credited to you. The second you believe, you're free from the penalty of sin. That happened in your past. Okay, that happened in your past. You believed sometime in the past. Everything after that is future. Now you are in the sanctification process. Sanctification simply means set apart unto God, free from the power of sin. That's presently. For your whole life, that's your journey. In the last phase you get when you pass from here into heaven, that is glorified. Glorified, the state of perfection. Now, isn't that going to be nice? I mean, I cannot tell you how wonderful that's going to be. Yes, no longer temptable, free from the presence of sin. Those who pass the test are loyal to God, believe and receive the gift of salvation, are confirmed in their holiness and saved. There will be no 
more rebellion in heaven. The elect angels and the elect humans will forever be perfect. And I can tell you, this is good news. Now, why is Satan bound and then let loose? That's the question of the ages. You're wondering that question, aren't you? Yes. He must be released for a little while. Why? Why is he released? Now, remember, everyone that goes into the millennial reign of Christ are saved. The earth, the earth people on earth, okay? They're going to have children. Those children will have a sin nature. And I think what God is showing us is twofold. That even with Satan bound, the one that we're always blaming for the sin, remember Flip Wilson? The devil made me do it. Well, no, the devil might have enticed you, but he didn't make you do anything. You did it on your own. So these people will be going in, having children, and they're going to have to choose to believe in Christ, follow him, obey him, his rule and reign, or rebel against him. Now, depraved mankind are going to be still flesh-driven in the kingdom, in the perfect kingdom. It'll have a perfect king, and they're going to rebel against God. Why? Because people have an innate depravity to want to do their own thing. It's my thing. Do, 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 do what you want to do. Yeah, that's, the, that's, that's my age. That's my, that, we brought all this stuff in. Do your own thing. To not submit to God's rule. Sociologists tell us something. It's all about the environment. Oh, if we could just take them out of their environment, everything would be perfect and wonderful. Psychologists say, oh, it's about the family and it's about the traumas of life and its effect on the mind. If a person just had everything perfect in their home and in their minds, and everything was just great and wonderful and terrific, that is not true. How do I know? God tells us something quite different. Man is evil... Because man is fallen. Listen to the words of Jesus regarding this. In Mark 7, 21 through 23, talking about the evil that resides in each one of us that wants to come out so often. Listen to his list. He's telling his disciples, For from, for, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, we're murderers, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile a man. There is not a peep here about Satan. There's not a peep here about demons. It is the way that we are. We do not understand the degree of depravity that we have as humans. We don't understand it. And this, this part of humanity will go into the millennial reign of Christ. Now, what do humans need? What do humans need? Humans need a Savior. People need the Lord. If you want to live differently, if you want to have a chance against these things that reside within you, you need the power of God resident within you to overcome. And that's a, that's a miracle of Jesus. Salvation is a miracle of God. To truly be born again, given life to your dead spirit, and given a new nature, that is God's miracle. Closing. Just a thought. Satan is chained. Okay, we have that. Uh, all through history, there's been an effort to bring peace to the earth. No man, no nation, no technology, no science, Nothing is going to bring perfect peace to this earth until Jesus comes back. It's only going to be a God thing. The millennial kingdom Messiah will be wonderful, but it will not be perfect. Why? Because there will still be sin in the kingdom. There will be sin in those who rebel against God. But I want to give you just a few things of what the millennium will look like. Number one, Satan and his demonic hordes will be bound, and they will not have influence on humanity. That's a big deal. That's huge. The earth will be changed. The earth will be redone, and it will be made into a virtual paradise. Think about this. Perfect weather. Perfect temperature. Now, I don't know what the perfect temperature is, because mine is about 72, 
but yours might be 69, yours might be 75. Hey, whatever we're going to be there, it's going to feel perfect to us. Perfect growing season, perfect beauty. The animal kingdom will also be changed. Now, with those people that don't believe in a millennium or say we're in the millennium now, where do they see the following? Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6 through 9. The wolf will live with the lamb. I'm not seeing that. They garble up the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. Not seeing that. The lion and the yearling will be together. Not seeing that. The infant will play near the cobra. Now, we're not seeing any of that stuff. I mean, let's have some sense here when we're looking at the word. There will be a change in aging, sickness, and disease. Jesus will be there. There will be an abundance on earth. There will be a lack of nothing. All needs will be fully met. There will be peace on earth, and Jesus will make sure there's peace on earth because he will rule with a rod of iron. He will deal with evil. There will be a change of government, and Jesus will reign. So, in all of this perfection, people will still choose to rebel against God. It's out of the heart come these things. It has to be a heart change, a heart transplant. It's amazing to me that mankind will still be steeped in self-rule and self-gratification. And they will ignore the perfect world, the perfect environment, the perfect opportunities, the perfect government. When we get in the millennial reign, it is never going to be, I'm sick and tired of this. It's the same thing over and over. No, it's going to be dynamic, wonderful. The heart of man is depraved. To the surprise of many, people are not generally good. You put a human in the right conditions, and that human, regardless of who they are, can be extremely savage. Extremely savage. The heart of man is depraved and refused to have God rule over them. Jesus knew that people would reject him. In Luke 19, 14, he says the following. This is a parable, but this is a parable speaking about him and how the people will receive him. But his citizens hated him. Isn't that astounding? And sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man rule over us. There are those today who will choose separation from God forever rather than to submit to God's rule. And let me tell you, that is insane. It's really never been about the evidence, folks. The evidence is plenty. The heavens declare the glory of God. God has written his law in our hearts. He's given every human a conscience. We know intuitively that there is a God out there. Every place you go in the world, there's a worship of God. There's something greater out there. Make no mistake, God has revealed himself. It has never been about the evidence. It's always been about the stone-cold, hard hearts of humanity. Invictus means unconquerable, undefeated. That is the humanist view of themselves. When you see what's going on in globalism in our world, and you see some of these pictures come on the TV of who these globalist leaders are, they just resonate with Invictus. We're unconquerable. We're undefeated. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And I can tell you that is a lie from the pit. That is a lie from the pit. This has always been the humanist battle cry. I will be my own God. And it resonates today throughout our world. There is a point. There is a point when God says, okay, have your way. Now that is Terrible news. Have your way. Your will be done. God will give you the desires of your sin. Romans chapter 1 says three times God gave them over to their sin. Three times. And he doesn't do that easily. You've reached the end of the road with God. There is a point when God says, okay, have your way. And let me say that. Sad day, sad day. The saddest end of all is this. God gives you over, gives you what you want. 
You never want to go through life getting your own way. Never. It is always thy will be done. God knows what is right. We simply do not know. We think we know. We think we want that car. We think we want that house. We think we want that job. We think we want this. We... God knows. Just, just rely on the sovereignty of God. Satan is chained, and these depraved souls are also changed. Thinking they're free, they're never really free. Never embracing real freedom. And you know who sets you free, don't you? Yes. If the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. John 8.36 Never bound by anything in life. Real freedom, folks. Real life. Real joy. And by the way, real peace. No matter what's going on, when your waters get so turbulent, you can't have any stability whatsoever. You turn to Him. Jesus said, these words I have spoken to you, that in me you will have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. It's found in Jesus alone, except, folks, no other substitutes. People will try to get peace multitudes of ways. They'll get active in something. They'll try to be runners and get runners high. They'll try to take drugs. They'll try to immerse themselves in work. Hey, you get peace one way, and that is through a relationship with Jesus Christ, except no other substitutes. Satan will be chained one day. And next week, you will see the saints will reign. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us to study your word. As always, we're so grateful for it. Uh, Lord, you've spoken to each one of us. You've given us your, your power to be overcomers. We have your authority to walk victoriously in this world as long as we obey and submit to your rule. Help us to do that. Lord, I do realize that life is not easy. It's, it's, it's extremely difficult. And it is turbulent. Uh, everybody in this room has experienced unsettledness. Some of them have been tsunamis, maybe a little bit less than that, but we've all experienced it. God, we need you to enter into these situations and miraculously give us the peace of God that passes all understanding. Lord, may we rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. May our hearts be joyful towards you, regardless of what's going on around us. And I pray that your miracle of peace and joy will fill each one of us. Because Lord, we need it. On this side, we need it. And help us to walk in a way that makes, us, makes it available for us to have your peace and your joy. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.